Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get a copy of today's program and other helpful documents. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Hello, you're listening to KABF in Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm Carrie McCoy, and it's time for me to get up into your business. For the next hour, via phone and email, my guest and I will be, to the best of our ability, answering questions and giving advice to small business owners and to people who dream of owning a small business. You may be asking yourself, what makes this lady qualified to do this? And I'll tell you, experience. So in a minute, you can email or call and ask me anything. My experience is deep and wide, and my advice is free. Forty years ago, with just $400, I started Arkansas Flag and Banner. Since then, it's morphed into simply flagandbanner.com with sales nearing $4 million. That's worth saying again. I started Arkansas Flag and Banner with just $400, and today we have sales nearing $4 million. I started by selling flags door-to-door, then went to telemarketing, next mail order and catalog sales, and today we rely heavily on the Internet. In addition, over the last 40 years, I've navigated Flag and Banner through two recessions and two wars. When people find out I'm that woman who owns Arkansas Flag and Banner, they often say, oh, I've heard about you, and begin asking me business advice. I amaze even myself with all the knowledge I've gained. If you call me for advice or my guest, you will not be given textbook answers or theory, but you will be given candid advice from real-world experience. So be prepared to hear the truth. It's not always easy to hear. For instance, you may not want to hear this. In business, there are very few overnight successes. Starting and owning a business takes persistence, perseverance, and patience. When I started Arkansas Flag and Banner, I supplemented my income by waitressing, all while I peddled flags door to door. After nine years, did you hear me? Nine years of working a part-time job, the company began to grow and solely support me. My first hire was a bookkeeper to handle the clerical side of the business. My expansion was to begin the manufacturing of custom flags, so a sewing department was developed. The next decade ushered in the Desert Storm War. Flags were scarce, so a screen printing department was hurriedly built to meet consumer demands. In addition to sales and manufacturing, Flag and Banner now has a purchasing department, shipping department, technology department, marketing department, call center, and retail store. And I spearheaded the development of every one of these departments. My experience is deep and wide, and my advice is free. I hope you'll use it. Before we start taking calls, I want to introduce you to the people at the table. We have Tim Bowen, our technician, who will be taking your calls and pushing the buttons. Say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. My guest today is Alan Ingstrom. He's the founder and managing director of CFO Network. Allen received his MBA from the University of Texas at Austin. Before starting his company, CFO Network, he held impressive finance positions for both Motorola Semiconductor and Intel Corporation, where he was promoted again and again until finally deciding in 2004 to move home to North Little Rock and start his own business. CFO Network offers the most creative counting solutions I've ever heard of or seen. I love their business model and thrilled for him to talk to you about it. In addition, they are consultants and business advisors to both small and medium-sized companies alike. Today, Alan is going to share his big business experience with us. Welcome to the table, Alan Ingstrom, Managing Director and Founder of CFO Network. Thank you very much, Carrie. I really appreciate you having me here today. I love we're, having you here today. We're going to have a lot of fun and you hopefully are, answer a lot of questions. I hope so, too. I hope people aren't shy about calling in. First, Alan, can you describe to our listeners what CFO Network is and what it does? Sure. We're just a better alternative to hiring your own internal people, uh, accounting people, ranging from bookkeepers to accountants, controllers, financial analysts, even chief financial officers. Uh, We just, we put together a team, we understand what the company needs, we go in and we create solutions that help companies uh, perform better, grow better, uh, provide better reporting, 
analysis, advice uh, that's just a superior value compared to the typical alternative that small businesses face when they hire internal people? I think superior value is the correct word because most of us small business people like me shoot from the hip. Finally, after 20 or 30 years, I was kind of like, you know, I should probably look at my income statement and financial (laughs) statement and use some data. So I think this is wonderful that you offer this to people. I want to talk about three things about you today. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your experience, what makes you qualify to analyze and consult small business owners and startups. I want to talk about your decision to come back home and open your own consulting firm, which makes you an entrepreneur, too. And then I want to talk about the services that CFO Network provides and how you can help our listeners. So let's start with your first job at Motorola Semiconductor. I don't even know what that is, and I don't even really know what you did there. So tell us. I was a cost analyst, which is, uh, for a lot of people, that would be boring work. But for me, it was fascinating. It was going in and analyzing just the billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar factories they had and, and trying to help them understand um, their costs and how to do things more efficiently. They had uh, a lot of situations where they were sending work overseas, and uh, the internal cost that they were reporting appeared to be too high, but it was only because they weren't fully utilizing their capacity. And so I did an analysis that showed if they sent all the work that was going overseas back internally, that the actual unit costs would come down in line with uh, what they were what they were paying other people. And that, You're kidding me. That ended up. You saving. mean sending it overseas was costing more than hiring uh, American workers and doing it right here? Yeah, exactly. So, so were they just buying like, into the BS and thinking this is the way to do it? Well, if you have a three billion dollar factory and you only want run one unit through that factory, the unit cost you can imagine. What's would, one unit? Mean one product? One semiconductor. Okay. Yeah, this is an extreme example, obviously, but. They had low volume, and so the, the cost per unit, when you have that kind of overhead, just showed that their unit cost was so high. And so these business managers within Motorola were saying, well, it's too expensive to do it ourselves, so let's just send it overseas. But when I did this analysis, it showed that if everybody got their volume together and put it through their existing capacity, that the unit cost would come way down. So I think you're saying that by sending it overseas, they couldn't manufactured to as large a scale as they were capable of. And so they had this large-scale operation, but they weren't putting enough products through exactly. the operation over there? It was a death spiral because the, the lower and lower volume you run through your $3 billion factory, the more it it shows that your your unit cost goes up because your You've got overhead, a big old factory. Yeah, and these managers were getting these reports that just showed, here's our unit cost this quarter, and it kept going up. So how many jobs did you create in America by doing oh, that? It was, it was hundreds of millions of dollars of savings for Motorola, so it had to How made, old were you when you did that? I was, I don't know, in my mid-20s probably. You were so smart. <laughs> I love that. Um so what happened after that? You decided to... So, you had, Intel, you fit, so they didn't need you anymore, probably, right, after you no. did that. It was, it was a great experience, but uh, Intel Corporation came calling, and uh, it was just an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. Uh, I interviewed for them. I actually did terrible in the interviews. I was actually trying to get a higher salary at Motorola because I really like Motorola. I'd just gotten oh. out of the MBA program, but they didn't have a, a salary structure for MBA students, and so... My boss actually suggested that I go interview with other companies and get some offers from some other companies and then bring it back to Motorola and use that as a way to get a higher salary. So that was my plan. I went to interview with Intel, and I hadn't done a whole lot of research on Intel. And I think the second question they asked me is, if you got an offer from Intel, where would you want to be? And I didn't even know where they were. And so I had to ask the interviewer, like, uh, where are you guys? And so he said, Phoenix, uh, California, or Oregon. And so... It was horribly embarrassing for me because I hadn't even taken the time to know where they were. And so I just assumed that I'd bomb the interview. And so I just thought, well, I'm just going to stumble through this and get done with it. And so I thought to myself, well, Oregon is too wet. California is too expensive. So by default, I said Phoenix. And long story short, I ended up spending six years of my life in Phoenix, Arizona. (laughs) And you asked for just so much money, you thought they wouldn't give it to you, and they gave it to you, and you couldn't say no. Right, so... Needless to say, the interview, the rest of the interview went okay, and they asked me back for a second round of interview, and uh, and things really went well, and they made me an offer, and uh, I ended up living in Phoenix working for Intel. For so did you years. go back and tell Motorola what the offer was, and they said, see you later? 
Yeah, but it was one of those things that just Intel just impressed me so much through the process that oh. uh, I decided that you weren't uh, expecting to be impressed. Yeah, it was a great company to work for. Tremendously. Uh, so incredible. I want to hear what your job was there, but before we move on to that, uh, I want to tell the listeners that you're listening to Up in Your Business with Carrie McCoy on KABF, and this is a mentoring show for small business owners. So there's no stupid questions. Uh, or for those who dream of owning a small business. My guest today is Alan Engstrom from CFO Network in downtown North Little Rock. If you've got questions or comments for either of us, call 501-433-0088. Or you can um, email questions to questions at upyourbusiness.org. And give them that phone number one more time in case someone's driving down the road, although they shouldn't be. 501-433-0088. Um, so you took this job, you went back, they said, all right, see you later. And were you going to go do costs for this company too? No, I, at that point I became a senior financial analyst. Which Sounds is, good. Yeah, it, was, it sounded good to me too. So we, uh, I would partner up with general managers of divisions within Intel and help them do business plans, uh, budgeting. I was on several product development teams, which is really interesting. We were designing semiconductors, and I, ha- I knew nothing about semiconductors. But I was the guy at the table that was in, kind of in between the marketing people who were trying to sell a bunch of stuff to people like Dell Computer or IBM, and then the engineers that were actually designing these incredible semiconductor products. And they would always, the you know how it is, the sales guys always want a whole bunch of stuff. And yeah. The engineers say, you know, we can't do that or it's going to cost too much. I was the guy kind of in between that was helping them analyze the di- different kinds of trade-offs between you know, offering more features on a semiconductor versus the cost to actually do it in terms of time and capital. And it was very interesting. I oh, I would love lot. that job. Yeah, it was You were kind of like incredible. the negotiator. Um, so they both were semiconductor. Intel mm-hmm. was semi, we were, you were still in the same industry because they were both semiconductors. But you went from analyzing costs and working with numbers to now you're actually having to learn about the product yep. and how to cut corners on the product to save money to meet what I know salespeople always want is a cheap price. Right. Yeah. It was the, you know, trying to find the right combination of features and cost. And uh, for every trade off, I would do a return on investment analysis, or there would be what we call time to market trade offs. You know, you have to design this extra feature into a semiconductor. It'd take longer time. You might miss a market window. So, all this stuff, I had a giant spreadsheet that would, you know, market model and a cost model and a capital. You know, all this stuff would get kind of baked into this giant spreadsheet that would help us make better decisions i love that if you were to think about those two jobs because right after this you went and started your company so it sounds like you like both jobs what made you decide i'm gonna quit doing this and i'm gonna move back home to little rock yeah you know um they say you can take the boy out of arkansas but you can't take arkansas the boy it's totally true i missed arkansas but what what, when the light really came on was uh was Later in my career at Intel, we started uh, acquiring companies, and I moved into Intel Capital, where we were doing mergers and acquisitions. And then uh, through the, the dot-com recession in the early 2000s, um, we were making private equity investments in smaller businesses. And That's not as much fun, was it? You know, it, the, the upside, was when, when things were going up, it was fun. We were buying things, it was fun uh, for a while. But what I really became interested in is the small business and i was i had a unique perspective because i was sitting at intel we had 10 billion dollars in cash in the bank we had every process and resource you would ever need to be successful and that was great but what i really got a view into is these small businesses that were doing so many wonderful things with limited resources and that's where i really i really found that interesting what did intel want to sell them what and was the what was the partnership they were trying to create? It was a lot of create. software companies. So Intel wanted to get. So you into, were out of semiconductors. Well, I was still in semiconductors, but Intel was trying to get into things like cell phones and tablets. They were strong in PCs. They were designing microprocessors for different what we call different platforms, like like cell phones, for example. Mm-hmm. If you have a microprocessor and you don't have any software, it's useless. And mm-hmm. so we had to make investments in a lot of software companies. And as part of that, they would write software to run on our new microprocessors. You were partnering with small software companies? Yes. So uh, I would go in, and when we were buying them, I would, I would go in and analyze them and determine I how I know much those we software companies love that. Yeah, I they mean, love that's that. like a software programmer's oh, dream yeah. come true is come we buy would walk my software. In there and, you know, I would sit down with the chief financial officer of that company, and I would know how many stock options he had. And I was like, we're, we're about to make him, uh, you know, worth 
more than $10 million, you know, we'd walk into these companies. It was an amazing time, crazy time. Uh, but and how did the dot com play into that at all? Was there making software for? I don't know how the dot com really because they were. It was just a lot of craziness, quite frankly. I guess they just put the software <laughs> on the website, and everybody thought you put the software on the website, and everybody's going to come. And, and it was kind of an inflation in terms of what yeah. all the companies were worth, what right. other companies were paying for. Companies would kind of set the value for the other companies, and venture capitalists would come in and invest in these companies, and it was kind of a a snowball type of a spiral um and then of course the the music stopped and and everybody had to grab grab a chair reality hit reality hit and that happened in the early 2000s we stopped making acquisitions but we still had these strategic needs and so i was the valuation guy they still wanted to buy these companies the valuations were all underwater and so i was kind of dr no around intel <laughs> i was the guy that would go around saying sorry this it doesn't make sense um, and they got real frustrated with me, which is not a great aspect of my job. But I started learning this not only just say no, but to say no, but why don't you consider partnering with these companies instead of just writing a giant check, right? And How so, would that be different? Well, um, instead of just paying, say, $600 million for a software company, yeah. we, would, we would maybe invest... 20 million as a as a minority equity investor gotcha and as part of that we would have a negotiated uh, uh, service agreement or something like that that would say you guys are going to do these things for us mm -hmm. write software for our platforms that sort of thing mm -hmm. and finally after i kept saying no to all these general managers uh, they finally said well come over here and help us do what you're talking about which is really minority investments equity investments and partnerships and so that was really where the light went on for me is we would have to go into these companies and work with them as a as a partner instead of just going in there and buying them and that's where the, the light really came on for me in terms of what I wanted to do with the rest of my career is work with these small companies I love that um, you're listening to up in your business with Carrie McCoy on KABF this is a mentoring show for small business owners or for those who dream of owning a small business. My guest today is Alan Engstrom from CFO Network in downtown North Little Rock, Arkansas. If you've got questions or comments for either of us, call 501-433-0088. Or email your questions to questions at upyourbusiness.org. I need to look and see if I've gotten an email. I keep forgetting to look over there. Um, so you decided to move home. Mm -hmm. You went home, told your wife, Ashley. She said, yay. Where's Ashley from? She's from Little Rock. Oh, good. Yeah. So she was happy. Uh, and you've decided to move because your heart, your passion is with helping small businesses. Right. And are you going to use some of this software that you currently have today? Is that some of the software that you learned and used from Intel? No, so I, I think I learned enough about software companies, but a lot of the software we were investing in is stuff. Too that, big. Yeah, it's just giant, weird giant stuff. stuff. So that's how the idea came about. I don't understand your name, though. CFO, what does that stand for? Well, it's just a, it, it technically stands for Corporate Financial Outsourcing Network, but it's kind of a play on Chief Financial Officer. So. Oh, my gosh. I yeah. can't believe I never put that together. <laughs> Uh, and so you picked North Little Rock. Well, that's but, my hometown. But, uh, but, you know, I really just, uh, from my perspective at Intel, we had all the world's greatest resources and processes. And then I saw these small businesses that were doing great things with limited resources. And I thought, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we could come up with a way to, to sort of provide these world-class processes and tools and resources to these smaller businesses I knew enough about these small guys that you can't afford to have you know a full-time CFO and you know multiple bookkeepers and accountants and analysts and all this stuff like we had at Intel and so the challenge became how can we provide these services in a way that was affordable for small business and as it turns out going through kind of the accounting function is a great way to do it because we can go in and offer world-class advice consulting coaching analysis reporting just like if you were as big as Intel, but you know, at a price that's affordable. You use such big words, I'm going to dumb it down for everybody. <laughs> okay, so everybody out there listening, you know how you're always complaining, or at least I was when I was, when I was a new entrepreneur, about how my accountant never really helped me. They just took the numbers at the end of the year and paid my taxes, but they never really gave me business advice. And I always thought 
that accountants were like that. But that's not really what accountants are. And I tell people that when they ask me, why can't I get a good CPA that can help yeah. me with my business? And I'm like, because that's not really their job. Right. Accountants are wonderful. They are. Wonderful. They're great at documenting your history and where you are now. Following the rules. Keeping you out of jail. Taking care of all the detail that's got to be taken care paying of. Paying your taxes. Paying your taxes. Keeping you out of jail. Yeah. But you also, a small business owner also has other needs, like looking into the future, like helping you make better decisions going forward is always a trade-off, always a trade-off. Uh, helping you set goals, benchmarking yourself, putting in you know, cash flow analysis. Well, a good, oh, yeah, uh, a good one is you want to make an equipment expenditure. Mm -hmm. You want to buy a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to do the cost analysis right. with the benefit exactly. analysis. Should you buy it? Should you lease it? Should you outsource it to somebody else? That's where you come in great. Yeah. Um, that's a classic example. That's a, the one that I've made a mistake on more than once. Yeah. Should you get into a new line of business? Should you hire a new sales guy? Should well, you... I'm the worst at believing my own BS. Right. So, you know, I get an idea and then I put it on paper and try to get my get it on paper to match my idea all the time. Or say you, you hire that extra sales guy and you, you make an assumption, right? If I hire the sales guy... He or she should be able to bring in whatever it is, maybe $250,000 a year in sales. You go ahead and hire the salesperson, but then you sort of forget about the, that goal you had or that assumption you made, right? And so you need to have budgets in place and you need to do a, an analysis so that, you know, as you move forward, you can say, well, wait a minute, that person needs to be bringing in $250,000. So how's your benchmark for that? Yeah, so you So have what to, would it be? So what would it be? You'd be like, if he doesn't reach his goal in three months? Or well, is it because my training program's not good? But my point is, most business owners, they sort of make an assumption, they pull the trigger, and then they sort of forget about the assumption. Oh, and then they just keep them on the payroll yeah. forever, even though they never meet their goals. Yeah. Because they've got hearts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I do that. A lot of tough decisions. But there's, there's, there's assumptions you make on the front end on every decision. It's important to write down, why am I doing this? And have someone like you hold them accountable. Yeah, if you and you could do it yourself, but a lot of you know a lot of people need help a lot of times, and so yeah. it's just helpful. Your father's an accountant. He, he is. Is he still? Is he? Does he? You, do you work together? We do. Yeah, he's really? an expert witness. Um, what does that mean? He, uh, he you go people to, pay him a lot of money for him to sit around and tell them what he thinks. It's a great line an of work. Expert witness. That sounds <laughs> like he's a talk goes to court. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's kind of, uh, he works on an hourly basis, and uh, that's kind of his, uh, he makes a decision every day, should I go fishing at Lake Washita or should I work? And so he's got this magic number. If it's below that number for his hourly rate, then he goes fishing. And Boy, is that not just like to, an accountant? Yeah, it's perfect. I love it. Uh, is he worked down at CFO Network? Well, he had his own accounting firm, Ingstrom what was it? Yeah, it's called EGP. He's the E in EGP. What is it with y'all and acronyms? Yeah, the letters. I don't know. Just want everybody to guess who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so did your father pay influence on you becoming an MBA? Uh, he, Getting an MBA? You know, we come from a line of engineers, oh. and he was the rebel in the family. He didn't become an engineer, and I think that screwed me up. I realized belatedly that I probably should have been an engineer, but the cool part is I think – the way that I get to use those engineering aptitudes is by building businesses. So that's really my passion. I love, of course, to build my own business. But what really gets us out of bed every day is helping our clients grow their business. Everybody says it's that. It's really cool. Everybody says that. I think you really mean it, though. Oh, uh, yeah. It's... You like the problem solving of figuring it out. So you started in 2004. It's yep. 12 years later. What yep. was the hardest part about getting started? It, probably the stress. Um, I did some great things at Intel, but I'd never even managed anybody, not even one person, much less multiple people, much less ran my own company. And How so many employees you have? We have uh, 35 now. You have 35 employees? Yes. Yes. Yes, we do. So well, but after you tell me this, I've got the next question for you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so so what's it, was, it was probably, you know, when you, when you kind of cut the umbilical cord with the big company with all the great benefits and everything, and you, you know, you saved up some money, you borrowed some money, uh, you, you take the plunge, you move your family back, you, you open, you know, your business, 
and immediately cash starts going out to the bank, you know, and it's, it's a lot like what you said uh, about jumping off the building at the front of the show. I, I use the analogy building a plane at 30,000 feet, right? You start putting the plane together, but you're losing altitude fast, right? And you got to get it all together and you got to flip those engines and those jets have to fire up and you yeah. have to start gaining altitude before you hit that ground. That's a good one. And, you know, there's nights when you just, you're just laying there looking up at the ceiling, worrying about every little thing. And I think over the years, you just learn to really just focus on the things that you can control. And you, yeah. you just, it's just a mental discipline that, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, how does the, you know, the CEO of General Electric sleep at night? You I know? think about that, too. And I think the answer is, after many years of staring at the ceiling in my little nook of the world, is you you just have to get some mental discipline around only focusing on the things you can control. Because nobody gets an extra hour in the day. We all work in right. 24 hours. Yeah. You know, you, you're thinking this person does all this stuff, and you're like, well, how do they do that? They don't get an extra hour. Yeah. That's probably the hardest thing is just learning to deal with you know, stress. A lot of it was just me worrying too much about every little detail. And you, over time, a lot of effort. I probably, it probably took me a lot longer than most people, but you just learn either the easy way or the hard way. So how long did it take you? Like it took me nine years. Yeah. Well, It, it didn't take you that long. Nobody takes that they long. They say – you know, for firms like ours, it's a, it's like a three year. Well, and you're process. an accountant. You're probably better at cutting bait when you need to. Well, it's just a, you know, you just get critical mass. I knew that I had to hire some people to where I could focus on growing the business instead of working in the business. Right. And so you make that, you know, that that transition. That was my favorite one. book. You know what it, I'm fixing to say, don't you? Yeah. What the E Myth? Yeah. The my favorite book. Yeah, so you, you've got to get past that threshold where you can focus more on the business instead of getting bogged down in the business. That's a big deal. You've got to to learn to trust people to do their jobs. You've got to hire good people. You always hear that. Trust is important. Trust is so important. There's a lot of people that I that we that we work with that they're small and they will always be small because they can never get past that trust threshold with, with their employees. Right. They can't let go. And you can't, can't grow if you don't let go. You have to learn to trust people to do this. I job. tell my department heads that. You've yeah. got to learn to let go or your department cannot grow. Yeah. That's right. It's so true. And it's hard for a lot of people. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy on KABF. This is a mentoring show for small business owners and for those who dream of owning a small business. My guest today is Alan Ingstrom from CFO Network in downtown North Little Rock, Arkansas. If you've got questions or comments for either of us, call 501-433-0088. Or you can email us questions to questions at upyourbusiness.org. You have 35 employees. Yeah, that's crazy. I think you had four when I first did business with you. Yeah, that's right. Um, And you're now a client. I know. (laughs) Tell everybody what you mean by that. So uh, we just acquired, we did our first acquisition in our company history. We acquired a wonderful business called Winchester Business Services. They do payroll. We'd always avoided doing payroll. We preferred to partner. And uh, uh, Carrie's business, Arkansas Flag and Banner, uh, was a longtime employee of Winchester Business long time. Services. I hate doing payroll. Yeah. And I've been chasing Carrie and... Uh, for a long time, we've done work together. And yes, you're numerous great projects. I think if our listeners want to, maybe not hire you uh, monthly every month, but just want to come in and either have a project they want to bounce off you yep. before they go to the bank. Mm-hmm. Do you help people with their business plans? Absolutely, assistance with bank loans. We have former bankers on staff, so we put together all the things that a banker will want to see. We understand the ratios that they look at and all the stuff that they're going to look at and help companies restructure their debt or get new loans or other types of financing. Yeah, absolutely. You, for me, ran a bunch of reports. So, like, I just came in, and you ran my accounts receivable report, my accounts payable report, my cash flow report, and all these ratio reports like debt to net. Debt to equity. Debt to equity. (laughs) And something I think called a quick asset. Quick ratio. Yeah. Quick ratio, which is my favorite one. Yeah. 
which if our listeners are listening tell them what it is and i think they should run this every single solitary month at the end of every month when they get their financials yeah so it's just uh looking at your sort of short-term liquidity which is uh liquidity is fancy words for yeah know, cash obviously is very liquid um Accounts receivable. accounts receivable things you know near so you add up your stuff. accounts receivable and your money in your checking account mm-hmm. and then you subtract off your short-term liabilities which is typically accounts payable so you divide your accounts payables mm-hmm. into your accounts receivable and your cash yes and that tells you your debt to your short-term liquid position essentially is, that's right because in the near term you're gonna have to settle up all this so all your receivables People are going to be paying you, so you got cash coming in, but then you've got to pay out all of your accounts payable, all your bills. And so if your accounts payable is greater than your accounts receivable, then you could be in trouble because you're going to have to... Well, and it can't even get that far. If it gets to one-to-one... One-to-one, that means... You better be at the bank already, or you are. if it even starts to get to -to two-to-one, if it drops below, you have two assets Mm -hmm. to every one debt and we're talking about current Mm -hmm. liquid yeah so if your cash and accounts receivable are a hundred and your payable is fifty dollars right and you're then you're now at two to one that's good that's fine yeah but the minute it starts getting to one to one fifty dollars of Income, fifty dollars of money in the bank and accounts receivable, mm-hmm. and fifty dollars that you owe, you are almost too late to go to the bank already. That's right. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people hire us to do what I call see around corners. That's a great way to put yeah. it. Yeah, and it is. It's it. You know, the analogy of like flying a, a plane is, I think, relevant. You know, Again, imagine. Yeah. So this time you <laughs> are you a pilot? Let's say now are you a pilot? Did I or want to be pilot? <laughs> let's say now that your plane is built. Okay, you're okay. flying it. But you're flying through the mountains, let's say, at night, right? So the objective is to get through the mountains without running into it. Right? So you're blind. So you've got to navigate. And the the point is you've got to have good instrumentation. You've got to know where you're going. You've got to know when you need, you're going to need to turn here, you know, and you're going to need to correct over here. And you have to use your instrumentation. That's the point. And your your financials is, if not the most important, it's one of the most important sort of instruments that you have in your cockpit yes i think uh entrepreneur's ability to motivate people ability to dissect a problem Mm -hmm. uh, inability to accept failure Mm -hmm. and then you've got to learn to use your instruments at hand and it's hard for a lot of people that's another issue we see you know you go through these stages when you start a company You can succeed by what I call just walking around, managing by walking around. It's a valid approach to managing. It's what I did for 20 years. It's, it works. If you're small, if you're small, you can have one-on-one ties with every employee and typically all your clients. But at some point you get so big, you lose those connections and you lose that intuitive feel. And what good managers do is they recognize that. And at some point you have to shift to managing by the numbers instead of managing by just walking around. I cannot tell you how many times that has happened to me, that my intuition was wrong once I looked at the actual numbers. Yes. We have a caller. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Good afternoon. Hello. Do you have a question for Carrie McCoy or Alan Engstrom? Well, this is Bob. This is a long-time Hey, Bob. Where have you been? Third time caller. Well, I've been uh, well. I, I, I've been busy managing. Walk, I've been walking around. So here you go. Right. <laughs> hey, I read a great article. Uh, I don't remember the name of the website, and it makes so much sense. If you, if, you know, if, if if you work in any kind of business and you've got employees, okay. If you really think about it, the most important customer you've got are those people. That's right. They need to be a walking, talking, living, breathing proponent of what you're doing. You know, if, if you work in the automotive industry like I do and have for almost 25 years, you know, I think the first place to look for customers is go to the employee parking lot and see them, how many of them have, you know, tags from the, your agency on their cars. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really important. Uh, and also, and I'll just I'll close it with this. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, think about it. I, mean, uh-huh. I never have, though. That's interesting. Well, I mean... You know, the most really the first customer needs to be the one that works for you. Well, I have to say, all my employees buy my Arkansas Flag and Banner products, so I, they're all good people. 
There you go. There you go. It's, but it, it, I, I think it's something to look at first. And look, Tim's over there wearing my T-shirt right now. Yeah. Right. You're wearing your T-shirt. Tim's wearing my T-shirt right now. Dreamland Ballroom. Yay, I Tim! Love, I love T-shirts. In <laughs> fact, and I'll and I'll, I'll can I brag on my own company just for a second? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, one of my company's arms is we have a cookout team that I'm a member of, Gluttony Grilling Team. Yeah, I said it. You said and it. Last night we did our last cookout of the year. Okay. In two years, we've served fifteen thousand people food. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. So this is not just some kind of fly-by-night type of deal. But here's the thing. You know, you know, it, when does a customer become a customer? After they buy something from you? No. Okay, good. Right. Treat everybody like a potential customer. That's right. Everybody, okay? I don't care if you're if you move your cart over in Kroger to let the ladies in the wheelchair go by. Treat everyone like a customer. Well, just treat everybody like you want to be. Treated. Well, yeah, yeah, but er- everybody, everybody is a customer. For hey, Bob, people. you're my, you're my best fan. I want to give you two tickets to Dreamland Ballroom tonight. We're having dancing into Dreamland tonight. Oh, t- t- tonight's not good. Tonight's oh, not good. thank you, thank you, thank you. But tonight's not good. But you know what? What? Tell me your, tell me your size, your t-shirt size, and I want to make one of my shirts. How can I? Can I do that? Oh yeah, I'm a small or a medium. Okay. No, I'm probably. Is it a boy or girl size? Uh, just adult sizes. Oh, that'll be a small. That's a man size, adult size. I'll that send, means I'll, man. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll send you a couple T-shirts. I got your address on, on on the web and so forth. But I'll I'll hang up some somebody else to talk. All right. Just uh, just keep it up. Good Take to hear care. from you, Bob. Thanks, Thanks for Bob. calling in. Bye. Bob was our very first call in. Oh, that's great. In case he, anybody's listening, that was nine weeks ago. You're my ninth oh, interview. It's amazing. I know. I love it. So, of all the favorite, rep- he's always got a good story to tell. Of all your favorite reports. Which one do you... I've already told you my favorite report. It's the quick ratio, because I look at it. So what's your favorite one? When a, when a new customer comes to you and says, help, yeah, I need some guidance. You know, it's got to be two. It's got to be the balance sheet and the income statement. Well, that's not a report. That's just a report, but that's not... Okay, what's a ratio. I, okay, ratio. Yeah. I'm sorry. You yes. know, ratios are good, um, but they only tell a very narrow slice of the story. The real value is looking at your financials your balance sheet and your income statement and even then you need to compare it to something else so we like to look at um, say current month to the previous month and look right. at what's changing we like to look at year to date compared to the same period last year and look at what's changing so one number sort of one column of numbers doesn't really tell you as much what really helps is a picture based on having a base of comparison it could be actual to budget it could be like i said before it could be some benchmark that you have from you think budgets are worth it i do you know there's two different schools of thought i know some people say you know it's just like crystal ball predicting the future and it never works knows what the future is going to be so why do it i kind of thought that when i went into intel but what i really discovered was it's the process that really is the value oh forcing you to think forcing you to think through Okay, if I want to grow my revenues by 20%, what do I really need to have in terms of resources, spending, investments, et cetera, et cetera, so that I can do that? And then again, once I do that, how do I hold myself accountable? How do I hold my team accountable so that we can actually achieve that 20% growth? So do you look at it every month if you put that budget in place? Do you do a monthly budget? Absolutely. With all of our clients, we have budgets. We uh, will for most of them. You know, I'd like um, to have you do a budget for me. I try to do it in my yeah. software, and I can't figure it out. Yeah, it's too you need hard. To do that. Yeah, I should have you do that. It's it, the journey and the process is very valuable, and the way that you do it matters. The way that you enlist your team, getting their input so they have buy-in, it allows you to. Do you hold look back two years or five years? I do four-year projections. Yeah, so we'll do. Um, like a five-year long-range plan, which is fun because you can dream about your business and mm-hmm. you, know, you probably have some ideas about what the potential of your business is. You take the extra step of kind of quantifying what that looks like and thinking through, again, all the different investments you need to have in place, people, facilities, whatever it may be. And then you kind of work backwards to where you are today, and you connect the dots. You make sure that it makes sense. Yeah, you don't buy, believe your own BS like I like to do. right. And then you kind of take year one, and that's your monthly budget. You break that out by month, and you look at, again, you know, what am I doing now? What do I need so to So when you look backwards, how far back do you look? Just a couple of years, two or three years would be fun. 
So I think I said that backwards. I look backwards mm -hmm. four years. I look forward two years. Yeah, that's that's probably reasonable. Because in the flag business, we can have major spikes. I mean, you can have a Confederate flag hullabaloo and everything goes crazy. You <laughs> right. can have a war and everything goes crazy. You can yeah. have a gay pride, weddings, and yeah. everything goes crazy. So then you'd probably have to look back in history and look at kind of how often does that happen and what kind of capacity do I need to have on hand so that it, you can take advantage of those spikes, right? Yes. So, you know, you probably want to look back on history to understand kind of how you're how your company has behaved in the past and make sure that you have the ability to capture that upside when it comes. So how'd you handle all this growth? You went to 35 employees. That's like the kiss of death. Yeah, so definitely not overnight. It's been 12 years. And the, the thing for our business is just keeping things in balance. And so we try to kind of regulate our growth and pace ourselves. And we, we work really hard to bring on good people at the right time. And so um, we try to kind of keep the hiring and the the growth kind of in balance. That's kind of the secret for us. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy on KABF. This is a mentoring show for small business owners or for those people who dream of owning a small business. My guest today is Alan Ingstrom from CFO Network in downtown North Little Rock. If you've got questions or comments for either of us, call. 501-433-0088. Or if you're a private person, you can email me. At questions at upyourbusiness.org. So talk about your software. How do you do it? Do people, because I think if I know this right, what I love about your business is they, you connect directly to them. You download my, like if I was doing this with you, of course, I'm kind of my own CFO, but I'm not as experienced mm -hmm. or as good as you are by any means. But um, if I was to give you my financials, I don't print them out or send them to you necessarily in an Excel spreadsheet or export them to you. You come and get them electronically and have it trans. It, well, it goes not, over the internet yeah. to you, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it's not. You download my stuff straight to your computer, don't <laughs> yeah. you? I would say that's the magic sauce. Uh, most companies have sheet-fed scanners, and that's really the, how we get the information. Is what now? Say that again. Sheet-fed scanners, just multifunction printers, and you just drop your bills into the sheet-fed scanner, and you hit a button that comes to us. We enter everything for you. We pay your bills. We do your financial statements every month. And then the cool part is this this is where the, the magic is really having great accounting, which is fine, but if you've also got to be in position to to leverage that hard and wonderful work that the accountants are doing. And so we have financial analysts who when the accountants are done, the analysts take the numbers and they we you know, we, we analyze it. We lay them out on a table and it's a, a really cool thing happens for us is we can actually we're looking at a bunch of numbers, but they tell us a story. And that's the that's You're where such we get a nerd. excited. Yeah, well, totally. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the story of a company is you can see it in their numbers and how they're changing and what happens when revenue goes up, what happens to their balance sheet, all that stuff. Yes, we geek out on it. But to us, it's a story. And uh, we leverage our experience. We've been doing this for a long time. We work with hundreds of companies. We've seen all the mistakes they've made. We've seen all the how they've responded amazingly and adapted and grown and done wonderful things. And then what do you do with that information? You call them, you send we, them an email? We sit down with the clients. If they're local, if they're not, we get on a go-to meeting or something mm -hmm. like that or a video conference, and we show them our, our screen. We show them what we're seeing. We talk to them about the story. They talk to us about what's going on qualitatively in the business, and it is the coolest conversation you know, I love those conversations. It's, I really um, do. You know, it, it's people out there on the front lines fighting every day. You do know, they to, argue with you? Because every time someone asks me business advice and then I give it to them, they argue with me. <laughs> do they argue with you? Uh, I, no, they don't. What? Usually. No. Well, you are one of those people, numbers guy that's really personable. Well, I would say people that are drawn to us and that stay with us are people that, Want that to are know. coachable. And they really care about their business. So you're heavily, you're, you're also a bunch of techie guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm amazed at how many people come out of college with an accounting degree and don't know have a computer science degree with it. I yeah. don't even think you should be able to get an accounting degree without a computer science degree. Yeah. You know, there's so much great technology out there that you can, instead of developing yourself, we always look for, you know, buying it or, or licensing it instead of developing it ourselves. And there's just so much great stuff out What'd there. What'd you just say? Can... You want to make your own software? No. No, what'd what, you no, say? We don't want to make oh, our own okay, software. Oh, okay, good. I yeah. was about to say. There's that so sounds much good awful. stuff out there. Yes. We, 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 have, we integrate 
stuff. Um, Are you open to say what your favorite software is? You know, QuickBooks is Everybody likes the best. It. And we started out agnostic. As That's way it. too small for me. And then it jumps up to. You would be surprised. No, I would not. I use QuickBooks at home. <laughs> I use it. A lot of people use it at home. I use QuickBooks forever. Peachtree, Quick, QuickBooks. We have a $50 million company running on QuickBooks. With 20 million products? Not quite that many. Well, I have 22, not million, I mean 22,000 products. the best software for managing 20 million products. Not million, you, I said right wrong, 22,000. Whatever. <laughs> that many. <laughs> a lot, right? A lot. You find the best software for managing your business, and then you, you pair it up with QuickBooks. That's where we do have some expertise is, at the end of the day, these companies are just databases. Yeah. And we can, we can teach the databases to talk together. So find the best of breed for accounting, which is QuickBooks, and then find the best of breed for what you need to run your business. So how does QuickBooks interface with the Internet? Well, there's an online version, but we host, typically we host QuickBooks Enterprise, which is the highest end version of QuickBooks. And that works out great. And it's got a shipping, and you can do all kinds of shipping yeah, module. Yeah, whatever, whatever. No, there, it's whatever. I call it best of breed software. Whatever is the best software for running your business. Oh. There, for all I know, there could be a flag and banner. No, software that we should make one. Except for there's only flag fifty flag and banner companies in the United States. Right. Like so one it's in something every... like Fish Bowlers. I don't know what you use, but there's Mass. There's applic- I use Mass. Ma- Two hundred. We'll okay. What? But we'll see. Wh- what? What were you going to say? Well, you're it, you're in the Stone Age a little bit. What? I just spent a fortune on the Stone Age. Yeah, it's a common issue we see. And what's the other Stone Age? When the problem Adpac- you're having is you, you, you're trying to combine great accounting with great at what you do. And usually there's, 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 so, there's hundreds of software applications out there that were developed for, for managing every type of business. And they try to bolt on an accounting package to that software. Yes. And they suck at that. And so the idea is go find the best accounting software, which is QuickBooks, and then go find the best software for running your business. And what you've tried to do, what Mass is, is But how do you integrate them together? That's the issue. Well, that's the thing. You don't, you integrate them through the back end. It's a database. Right, I know. And so yeah. you, you do but transfers. They, yeah, but they are, now you've got a third party. See, now you've got no, a third party. It's a lot easier than that. So there's wow. a lot of people. Wait, I need to hire him. Yeah, right. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money selling software. You and have no idea how much money guys, I spend every, on that. All these business owners are at the mercy of these people. And, I, and it is the biggest shame that I see when I go out and talk to business owners is they've spent $90,000 on software and it doesn't work because they haven't also spent 40 more thousand dollars on training. So you know what else is getting really big for stuff. me? Payables. And you know, that is not good for small business people to be doing payables because that's a waste of your time to sit around and push paperwork around. Yeah. Uh, so how, if you are, if you're doing payables for people, how do you know that you're not paying the wrong person? How do you know it's the right vendor? Does the owner of the company that does your customer have to approve every invoice and then mail it to you how do you do payables yeah so that's where the scanning comes in so one it's a weekly cycle so all the the weekly or all the bookkeeping stuff is done on a weekly cycle so you gather up all your bills you you scan it to us once a week we have an accounts payable specialist she enters everything into quickbooks we generate a report we also have a banking specialist that's reconciling your bank account and we send you two things. One is a nice, organized report that says, here's all your bills, here's what you need to pay this week. And then the second thing we send you is a reconciled bank balance so you can quickly verify that you have more than enough funds to pay these bills. And all you have to do is reply with approved, and we take care of the rest. All the checks go out the door from us. I wonder how many checks I write a month. It's probably a lot. A lot? Yeah. But it works really well. We save the scan batches, every entry we make into QuickBooks. We use the memo So what if field. I want to access that information? Yeah, so you could log into QuickBooks 24-7. You can look at every entry. We've got a reference name for every entry What if a we customer make. calls me up and says, I just received this package and I'm invoiced incorrectly? So it depends. Oh, well, that's not payables, though. That's receivable. So yeah. I could keep that part. Yeah, exactly. You can get into QuickBooks anytime you want. If you wanted to actually look at the source document, 
you look at the reference name that we enter in the memo field, and then you go over to your bills batch. So you could just take one through. module of my accounting. Yeah, you don't need possible. the whole accounting no. thing. Yeah. You could just do the payables part yep. only. Yep. And so that I could continue to manage mm-hmm. my sales, which is tied to my right. receivables, which is tied to my shipping. And then when customers call me up, because we ship 100 packages a day, yeah. when customers call me up, I could say, they said, you know. Yeah, I we can get, help you migrate to different software. We can help you with pieces of your accounting. Well, you're not even like an accounting firm. You're like a software we're, we're firm. We're more of a consulting company, yeah. Well, but you're more like a software firm almost, it sounds like. Wow, you're so smart. No, not at all. Yes, Just love are. what we do. And I got you great do. people. You do, man. You are passionate. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy on KABF. This is a mentoring show for small business owners. My guest today is Alan Ingstrom from CFO Network in downtown North Little Rock. We've only got, wow, it's flown by again. We've only got about five more minutes if you want to call and ask Alan something. I feel like I'm getting some great advice, though. Oh, here's a caller. You don't even have to give the number yet. You're listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy and Alan Ingstrom. What's your question? I'm a business owner in Little Rock, and I was actually, I, I didn't catch the first part of the show. I was interested to know, like, what do they charge? It sounds like you guys are bookkeepers, and what do they what do they charge? Answer that. What are, you're not a bookkeeper. Well, I mean, you are we a bookkeeper. Yeah, you yeah, do. So, so you, he's not going to give There's you no prices There's no way I could tell you, uh, yeah. right? right. Uh, but how do they on, contact you to yeah, find that out? So um, CFO Network, uh, cfonet.biz is our website. Say uh, that slower. Nobody can write sorry. that fast enough. Yeah cfonet.biz just google cfo network little rock or they could call the office what's that number 501-823-2363 you will love working with them and um do you mind repeating that one more time 823-2363 you talk so fast eight say it again too fast isn't it yes say it one more time 823-2363 you should thank you so much you should call him all right thanks for calling i will do well, this is already worth it for me. Honey, this is a mentoring show. It's not about <laughs> you. It's about the other people. So we can help others. That's what you said the whole time when you got here. Right. Got to stick, stick to, the, to the script. Yeah. So what's probably the, the, the best thing that you could ask me that I could help other people? One more question, right? Yeah. Uh, I already asked you what your favorite ratios were, and you told me. You know, uh, I, I might make a comment if I could, because okay. I get a lot of questions. Okay. I would say the number one thing is you need to expect more from from uh, your accounting and finance. I, I see it a lot uh, just because you're small. Don't think that you have to suffer quietly with if you're not getting your financials in a timely way, if they're not accurate, if you don't feel like you have the the instrumentation that you need to run your business to help you make decisions um, the accounting is actually for you. It's not for your tax accountant. It's not for your banker. It's for you to run your business. I love helping small businesses. I would love to uh, to help you guys run your business better, uh, help, help you leverage your accounting, your reporting, uh, help you understand what you're looking at. Um, I would just say you need to expect more from your accounting. I think you feel the gap that people yeah. have between – their accountant and their business because you know how to talk the language and tell the small business owner what they need to know you ran my accounts receivables my aged accounts receivables yeah. which i don't think people realize if their accounts receivables get too old yeah they're not any good al hodge came on and i asked him you know al right. from arkansas capital and i asked him what was his favorite thing he said aged accounts receivable he said he said small businesses just let those dangle out there forever yeah the banks won't loan on those yeah. No, after I don't know how many days. 90 days, yeah. And I don't even understand why aged accounts receivable are so important, but I know that that was one of the things you talked to me about yeah. also. Another one is people are growing and they're running out of cash and they don't know why. That's and so every small grow, business out there. They try to grow even more and that actually accelerates the problem. And you managed to do it to grow from four employees to 35 employees. I won't even ask you what your sales are. How many customers do you have? Uh, it's, well, contract clients, is it's got to be over 90 around the country. Oh, wow, that's a lot Yeah, to manage as closely as you manage them all. So you've managed to grow that much and manage your growth. Mm-hmm. So you know firsthand what it's like to give advice to a small business Absolutely. owner. Absolutely, yeah. It's not You're easy. You're awesome. You asked me what this cigar was for, and you said... <laughs> 
that I can't make you smoke it, <laughs> so I'm not going to, but this cigar is for you. Wow. It's for birthing businesses, your own business, and for all the other small well, businesses you actually. birth. Thank so you. you can give it to somebody else. Well, that's wonderful. I have yeah, if you smoke that, you'll throw up. I, <laughs> I have been known to smoke an, a cigar occasionally. So. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not pretty, isn't it? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, give everybody your information on how to get in touch with you one more time. Your phone number slow. Yes. Alan Ingstrom, CFO Network. My phone number is 501-823-2363. You did very good, Alan. Thank you. That cigar came from the Humidor Room at Colonial Wine and Spirits on Markham Street in Little Rock. They have a lovely Humidor Room if you do like cigars. So thank you today to my guest, the smart and very personable and passionate Alan Ingstrom of CFO Network in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Next week will be Thanksgiving, so my tech... Tim Bowen over there and I hey. Will, hey, will be playing excerpts from previous shows. It will be the first time we've ever done anything like that, so it ought to be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. The following week will be Margaret Ellaby. She's the president of Pulaski Technical College and her graduate, Cheryl Coldclaw, who recently started Be Blessed Bakery. And that should be interesting and a fresh perspective on a young person starting a business in today's world. I look forward to hearing a young person talk about starting a business. Also, if you have a great entrepreneurial story you would like to share, I would love to hear from you. Send a brief bio and your contact info to questions at upyourbusiness.org, and someone will be in touch. And finally, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with me and my guest, Alan Ingstrom. If you think this program has been about you, you're right, but it's also about me. Thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny. My hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next Friday at 2 p.m. on KABF Radio in Little Rock, Arkansas. Until then, be brave and keep it up. If you'd like to hear today's program again or download a free copy, go to upyourbusiness.org. All of our live shows are available online within 48 hours. Find this and other helpful resources to help you live the American dream.